Please join me in welcoming the co-director of One Child Nation, Nanfu Wang, and La Francis Hui from MoMA. Nafu, you have your team here with you. Yes. You um, like before before we start, I want to acknowledge my producers who are here tonight. Could you guys stand up, please? And Julie Goldman, Chris Clemens, and Carolyn Hebbon. Uh. Congratulations, Nanfu. You're doing really well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we, we're friends. We've known each other for a long time. Um, I, I think what is really incredible about this film is that it starts with personal stories about your family, your, the people in your village, and then it gradually builds up to something much larger, reaching different parts of China and even in the United States. From first-hand perspectives um, by the midwife, um, the village official, family planning officials, to people like journalists and um, um, orphanages and uh, American families, you have kind of mapped out this whole system of practice and thoughts. Can you talk about the initial planning of the film? Was it always something so enormous? Um, that was always a challenge. Um, from the very beginning, you know, the one child policy, anybody mm, I know, anybody knows that is a policy that affected millions of people. So it was the first time I worked on a film that is not really focused on following the main character's life, and which um, has been like my previous films. So I felt like this is going to be the first time I'm dealing with an enormous policy, and how do I do that? And it took a while to figure out the structure of how to move from one person to another. But it has always been the intention to cover almost every aspect of the policy, people who are on both sides of the policy, who carried out the policy, and the mm, women who were forced to have ab abortions, um, midwives, officials. It's just we knew that we wanted to get all this um, different dimensions, but it's in the editing room that to figure out how to move from one to another. And the American part of the story was also planned? That was during the research process that we found out. So my co-director, Jalin, and I worked really closely on um, reading a lot of material about the one child policy. And it was strange because we all, we were born in the 1980s and we all lived in China until our 20s, only moved to the United States for the grad school. So we kind of thought naively that we knew everything about the one child policy and now we just need to make it, like to show it. And it was during that process of reading um, articles, books, and we realized how much we did not know. And it was during then we uh, found out the um, adoption and the corruption in the adoption and the Utah couple that we found out them and we reached out to them. We had long conversations with Brian and Longland and sort of like initial conversations uh, hearing the stories that they told us. And that inspired us to go look for more stories and learn more about the, that whole international adoption program. It is um, extremely difficult to get people to speak on camera about anything controversial, especially related to the government in China. And um, it is also unusual to see them, these people especially, they, they, they participated in enforcing the one-child policy. And, um, and not only because they, they, they're complicit, but also because um, they could actually get into trouble for simply being involved in this film. Um, can you talk about like how you convince them to participate and also whether they have encountered any difficulties after this film has become a sensation? Yeah, it's um, interesting because the people who are in the film, that some that I thought it was going to be really difficult to get access to turned out to be easier, and some that I thought it would be easy uh, was extremely hard. Um, 
the people in my village was um, relatively easy because they all knew me and um, they saw me grow up. Um, they all know my family. So when I went back and I basically said to them, I wanted to talk to you to learn about what you witnessed and what you experienced. I wasn't saying that I wanted you to criticize the one child policy and it wasn't the starting point too. Um, I I wanted the film, it, and you, as you can see too, so many of them still support the policy and it was presented that way in the film. Um, so a lot of them were very open to talk about it. Um, the village official, the midwife, and surprisingly, the trafficker and the journalist in Hong Kong, those two took a long time to convince them to be in the film. The trafficker, um, he believed that nothing was going to help him, nothing was going to change anything in China. He was very disappointed by everything because he spent um, six years in prison and for you know things that he didn't consider was, was a crime. So at that point, he was like, what's the point of participating in, in the film like this? What's that gonna help? And I kind of had to convince him that this is not for now. And I, he literally, like during, during the conversation, asked me, what do you think this can change? And for a minute that I couldn't promise him the film is gonna change your life or change anybody's life at this moment, but I said, it might change people's awareness in the next five years or 10 years or 20 years. Um, maybe it's not your life, but it's somebody else like after you or somebody else 20 years later would know that um, what you did was not um, simply illegal or a crime as the government had portrayed you. Um, so that kind of changed the way that he um, looked at it. And the journalist in Hong Kong, he was a person who has a very little ego. He said, my work is out there. I don't want to be in the film. I, it's not about me. Um, and I said, yeah, it's not about, he said, I can give you all my material, the archival footage that you saw, uh, well, he, all his. He's like, I don't, you can use it as, as, as much as you want and however you want. And I don't want to be in there. And I said, yes, it's not about you. And I'm not making it about you. And I, I simply, because you witnessed this part of history and you exposed it, so I wanted you to be in here. Um, and I'm doing it not to feature anybody and it's for the history of China. And it's similar to what he wanted to do too. So that's what convinced him. Did they see the film? Yeah, um, all the people in the film saw the film. Uh, some of them saw the full ver film, full length. Um, some of them only saw their own portion. Um, we actually have them signed the release forms after we finished the film. Yeah, so, and that's the thing in China is tricky. You ask people, especially those who are 70 year old or 80 year old who didn't go to school to sign anything, they get freaked out. They're like, what am I signing my whole life? Or, you know, like, so um, we uh, didn't, I didn't ask them to sign then, because then that's what they would be worried about. And, um, but it, we finished the film and um, it was hard to get them to see because um, I was here and um, the censorship and then we were afraid of the Chinese government would get the copy or, so um, we actually had people in Hong Kong, in Beijing, in places that we trusted really well to take the film with them and go physically to meet with, the, let's say the journalists, the artist, and spend that day with them watching after watch it and then have them sign the release there. And for the other people, um, my mom took like, the midwife was just at that part to go, because you know, a lot of them have never seen a documentary in their whole life. Mm -hmm. If Even if you show them the whole version, sometimes they, they, they would have seen propaganda. Yeah, they've seen propaganda. <laughs> but so, um, so, but seeing their own um, part is really interesting because they loved it. Um, <laughs> 
they felt they were like, this is yeah, yeah, this is real. This is what I said. That's exactly what I said. You know, yeah. so so, uh, so that was not like a problem. Yeah. Were you under surveillance when you were filming? I believed so, um, given how effective um, the Chinese surveillance s system is. Um, we really took a lot of precautions when we were filming there. Um, a lot of times I went by myself um, just to try to minimize the risks of like being seen or getting attention. And we also tried to only like stay, make sure to stay in a private apartment, house, or uh, any indoor places and minimize the chances of showing in public. So I try not to stay in a hotel, take pu public transportation. And my co-director, Darlene, she stays in the uh, United States. She lives in Massachusetts. So she would communicate with the subject through encrypted messages, talking about where to meet and the when and the, you know, the time, and then communicate with me through encrypted messages about the same information. So me and the subject actually try to not have any trace of communication in case I was monitored or um, in some cases the artist the, who are sensitive, the journalist, they are monitored. So we really tried to take a lot of um, you know, planning and our producers also worked so closely on um, creating emergency plans, like if something happened, uh, Jalian and I were communicating like almost down to every every half an hour or something. Um, she monitored me on GPS real time, so she could see where I am exactly. And if I show up at a place that's different from what we planned, she was alerted. Or if I show up at the place for more than two hours than what we discussed, then she's concerned, like why I was there for much longer. And then if something goes beyond like four hours without touch or six or 24, then our producers have a list of like um, emergency contacts, like who to reach out to, to potentially could um, get me out of trouble if anything bad happens. Yeah. Um, and you, you have chosen to narrate the film in English rather than in Mandarin. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like a practical choice because this film, there's no way it would be um, accepted by censors in China. Um, but can, can you talk about that decision? Yeah. Um, so this is the third film of mine and, um, and all three have my narration in English. Um, at the beginning, the first film really was, um, like you said, a practical decision because I knew there was no way, that one is also political sensitive, there was no way that the film would get any um, official distribution in China. And the only way that I knew could get Chinese people to see it is actually for it to have a life outside of China, to have um, exposure. And once it's known outside of China, the news kind of travels back to China and people get interested in looking for um, uh, resources to find the film. Um, and that's how, how it happened. And it actually was um, eventually the process when once the film was shown in the United States and all over the world and then it got pirated and um, people have underground screenings and festival. And it was actually around that process, I was about to make a Chinese narration version too. Um, I started recording my voiceover and something really surprised me. Someone else did it. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> Somebody else dubbed it. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't be surprised by that. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, what surprised me was I went to the, the voiceover, um, you know, recording booth, and I had written, or basically like a word-to-word -word little translation of the English version, and I started re reading and saying, and I felt extremely uncomfortable reading it. Um, and it was strange. I had then I had a discussion with other um, friends who immigrated immigrated to the United States at a late age um, from other countries. I felt like 
there was a sense of un, like discomfort saying words about democracy, human rights. All those words, if you know, in China, in China, 人权 and 民主 they all have like a negative undertone, because for years in the media and in the news, that those were considered、um, subversive. Like even the words "human rights" is not a neutral word; is anything related to human rights? The word is negative. It's almost illegal to say those things. So when I was expressing it, I felt like there was a part of me that didn't feel comfortable saying it, as if like I was not supposed to say it, or as if those words don't have the same meaning as as I learned,、um, which kind of is like my political awakening happened. After I moved moved out of China, after I had learned English, like I felt like I became a a weak person in English、um, through the learning, through、um, the using of the language, and then going back to my original language, which I'm more comfortable with, but I can't say those words to express the politics.、Yeah. Um, how are people in China who have heard about your film or they've watched the pirated copy? Uh, how are they reacting to your film? There are two um, extreme, um,、uh, you know, attitudes on the、um, spectrum of like one is、um, it, we really appreciate this film existed.、Um, it's so important. We never knew this, and now we are learning so much. And the anger, outrage, disappointment at the government, the authority. And on the other end is、um, a lot of、um, defense. A lot of people would,、um, would be like, you know, China needed to have this policy.、Um, it's important, like most people in the film said that. And a lot of people also,、um, worse,、um, is like accusing me. They would be like. Oh, she did it because she wanted to make a film that's critical about China to, in exchange for American green card or American citizenship. Like she was brainwashed in Western、uh, by the Western culture. Now she is like pleasing the Western con- country mindset. There were some a lot of those um, attack. Um, yeah. Well, as you said, there are people、um, who justify. One-child policy, claiming that is for the good of the nation, and then there are people who detach themselves from responsibilities, claiming that、um, they didn't have a choice.、Um, the artist you interviewed in the film is very interesting. He mentions how national interest is above personal interest in China, and how that belief damages humanity and conscience. Leading people to support the government and the party without question,、um, I keep wondering:、um, such a big nation with thousands of years of civilization, how did people get so numb,、um, mm-hmm. so ready to compromise, and so ready to just accept things as presented to them? I think, like you said, there were thousands of years of history, and but if you look at those history、um, through all the different dynasties, it's similar.、Uh, all through the past history was、um, dictatorship. There is an emperor in the country, and there is no、uh, judicial system. There is no、um, rule of law, or anything, and there was a, a lack of.、Um, Um, transparency, of course, throughout from the central government through to the local government, and there is no、um, the, the information is restricted、um, in the past and now too.、Um, so that has not changed in a way,、um, and the the history is there. And then I think that's you know like even in the nineteen twenties,、um, people being numb and.、Um, A lot of question. A lot of literature is questioning people. Why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they fight? Why did? Why there wasn't a revolution?、Um, people have lived that life for a long, long time, and that kind of cultural value has been in this country 
um, for a long time. And I think right now, like during the, you know, in the, from the 1940s till now, um, similarly, um, there is no, people don't have access to the information other than what the government wanted them to know. Um, the media is controlled by the government. Um, in this case, um, all of them, they do feel like there is lack of choice. They don't feel, they don't know what the other option is besides following the order or otherwise end up in prison if they disobey the order. You mentioned in the film that like you left China in your 20s, there were many aspects of the one-child policy you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems like to me that like the young people of China, they don't know a lot of things about their history. Yeah. And um, I, I think that like people of your age, a lot of them have, might not even have seen an image of 1989 student no. movement. Or have never even heard of it. Yeah, yeah. so so it is. it becomes in, in, in very important for, for someone to create histor historical document like, like you did. Can, can you talk about <coughs> history? Um, yeah, I mean, like history was also always written by the ones who are, uh, who have authority, you know. Um, in China, it wasn't in our textbook or anything um, about the Great Leap Forward, much about the Cultural Revolution or the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest at all. Um, a lot of things that I learned kind of like after I left and when I talked to friends who also came from China to study here, like one friend told me that she learned about the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest when she um, was coming to the United States but had a um, transfer flight in Hong Kong and went to the bookstore and bought a book. And that's when she read it. And then that changed her life. And I've, I've known a lot of people like that. And that's kind of, I think, what made me feel like recording the history of the one-child policy is much more important because I feel I'm witnessing that part of history being erased or being changed, uh, distorted in a way when it's, when it's written in the history by the government. Um, it's all positive, it's all about the contribution, it's all glorious um, in the report when it ended in 2017, uh, 2015. So um, I feel if, I, if we don't do anything as our generation, then in 20 years people would just going to remember that version now that you have made this film, and also uh, Hooligan Sparrow, another great film you should check out, um, and also said all these things you just said, how are you going to suffer? <laughs> <laughs> like, can you go back to China? I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, I don't. Um, I hope so, because all my family is there. Um, well, when I made Hooligan Sparrow, I thought I couldn't go back anymore. and. Making One Child Nation was like testing the water and um, and then eventually I was able to and in the middle I made a film about America and they uh, it's about America's homelessness and mental illness and I was invited back <laughs> to show the film and there were state uh, media interviewing me and the interview kind of like it's suddenly like I was celebrated in China as a filmmaker. Um, and people know me, a lot of people in China know me as a filmmaker from that film and not the film about uh, which were banned in China. So maybe I make another film about how bad America is next <laughs> and then wait to go back to China afterwards. Great. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Anyone? We have some mics coming your way. Things. One, when women gave birth, why didn't they sterilize them then instead oh, of waiting till they were pregnant? No, they do. Um, um, usually that happened a month after they gave birth. So they let the woman go back and a month later would, um, it's a mandatory, like, mandatory um, thing that they would have to come back to the hospital to um, get a sterilization. But a lot of people, you know, when they... Um, they go, they, they go hide somewhere. They resist, like they escape. So the official would, um, there wasn't like a good 
archival, I mean, a gut, uh, another Chinese documentary. I don't know if you see it. It's called Mama's Village or something. I don't remember what's the title. But they documented the process of when the document of, uh, when the officials in the 1980s were going, they would climb into um, a house when they locked the door uh, and then try to get the woman out and the woman would be gone. They would go day after the day to, from door to door to make sure to drag the woman to go to a sterilization. But it's a difficult job. Like when you watch that film, you also would, or oh, when you see those scenes, you would like have some sort of like even sympathy towards the officials because these are the people, you know, they do things not because they wanted to or not because that they really know what is right and wrong. A lot of them have the um, dilemma and feel com conflicted just like the people we just saw, the midwife and the official, and it, they have to do like those horrible things. The other question, when, when they were inducing the uh, births and when the fetus was, on, was fully developed, if it was a male child, was it discarded also? Yeah, um, sometimes it was killed too. And sometimes that's when um, the family really uh, fought. Um, one audience member, a Chinese girl, um, told me a story that um, her mom was a midwife. And one time, like, her mom was, like, doing the forced abortion to another woman. And that woman had her entire family there ready to fight um, to, to, you know, to try to get the child because it's a late-term um, pregnancy. And a lot of men was like, we're going to fight to, like, death to get the child. And at birth, when they announced it's a girl, they dropped, like, they all had a stick weapons. They dropped a weapon and left. Um, so, yeah, there were a lot of stories like that. Um, I'm wondering whether or not any of the officials who spent years um, enforcing the one um, child policy feel at all conflicted or used with the change to the two children are great policy and also whether or not any of those who said, I only want a male child because that's the way my, our family will continue, feel it all conflicted with the idea that the male child can't find a wife? Uh, I, the first question, whether they feel conflicted, uh, I'm sure some officials do. Um, I even know like a few that I talked to, to uh, not on camera but off camera, have expressed you know regret and questioning about you know whether the government's policy is right and whether the government is doing even now with a lot of policies. A lot of officials, um, off the record, would have discussions um, about that. The second question. Um, whether the parents would um, feel conflicted and now they because they favored a male child, I think so. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. That they in China right now, a lot of people have said that um, it's um, it's better to have a girl now because the cost of having a son is really huge because men would have to buy an apartment uh, when they like get married or, so really like a lot of things have changed um, these days. Um, hi, uh, I didn't quite hear y your answer about have, have any of the people who cooperated with the film had repercussions? Uh, no one so far um, has been contacted by the government. My mom was, questioned um, recently by by the authority, but more um, was um, 
on me, like what I'm doing here, whether she know um, who I get paid from and uh, how much I got paid from and who do I hang out with, things like that. Um. Hello. Uh, I want to let you know that I have two great nieces that were adopted, two little wonderful girls that are Chinese. And uh, the thing that bothered me the most was why didn't the government, instead of killing these babies when they're eight and nine months old and aborting them, why didn't they just have the policy to have the children adopted? Um, the international adoption program in China started in 1990, early 1990s, 1990 and 1991. So before then, there was no, um, you know, no channel uh, process or agency that um, there was no law regulation, and not even like you know, China's opening up to the to to the world is happening in the 1979. So it took them a while to set up the international adoption program, and once that is set. Um, a lot of the people were adopted. A lot of the children were adopted. That's when you see the surge of um, Chinese adoptees. What happens now is two, two child Please wait, wait for the mic. Oh. So now there's a two-child policy. What if the lady gets pregnant and has a third? Are they going to let that child stay with the family, or is that child going to be adopted? I hope they don't abort the baby. Um, right now, the policy is much loose, although in some places, the um, people who have more than two would get a fine. But most cases, in the past two years since the um, two-child policy started, the birth rate did not go up um, as the government wanted. So um, it was really a crisis of like getting more babies. So a lot of the local governments actually, now they are on the having the opposite problem, that they would get punished if their local birth rate didn't go up. So they are using all the incentives to try to get people to have more children, which is hard because um, they can force people to have more children. But some places as we did our research and found that they would ask a couple to go uh, when they get um, certi birth marriage certificate, they would have to put down a deposit of like a thousand dollar, and they can only get this deposit back when they bring the birth certificate of their second child. So like they are using a lot of tactics to try to get people to um, to have more children, and there was um, prediction that in the next few years, soon that the Chinese government will lift the, the all the limit because of the slow growth. They're going to pay people to have babies. <laughs> um, let's have one final question, and then we, we can continue to talk to the director at the reception. Uh, my question is more personal for your story. Since your mother focused on your brother's education, what was your path to education? How did you make it out of China? And then you, I'm curious about that. Um, I started working when I was 16, um, a, a lot of different jobs, um, but eventually, I, um, ironically, because of the lack of education resources in my hometown, I became an elementary school teacher there. And in China, there was a system called self-teaching program, so you can read books um, while you work. And then once you read a certain amount of books, you can participate in an exam. So I did that while I was um, teaching um, for four or five years and um, self-taught and then took those exams um, every three months or half a year. And eventually I got an equivalent of a bachelor degree. And with that, I could apply for higher education. So I got into a graduate program um, in Shanghai in 2007. And I graduated from there, um, worked another year in Shanghai before I applied for grad school in the United States. And I came in 2011. Um, when it came to uh, the birth families that you talked to, uh, 
Were there any families that didn't want to know what happened to the daughters that were then put up for adoption? Or did everyone seem to be curious about what happened to them? Yeah, I think everyone wanted to know what their child is and whether they are okay, how they are doing, what they look like. Um, I think anybody who is a parent um, could understand that. Um, you have a child, gave birth. Um, you, I, I would imagine like no parent would not think about that child um, throughout their life. So they were all, they all wanted to know. Well, thank you so much, Nanfu, and thank you all of you. And let's go and drink. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, me and our producers will be all out um, um, if you stay around and wanted to talk. <laughs>